Good morning. Welcome to Stony Creek United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Michael. I am happy to see you all here. Those of you joining us outdoors here in your cars or in the pavilion, as well as those joining us on Facebook Live or listening to this later on our podcast or our call-in number. Um, it is the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, the first week in September. There's a bit of a breeze, as you might be able to tell. Um, and I'm going to hand everything over now to Barb, who's going to tell you all kinds of fun stuff going on. Okay. For, is this coming through okay? Okay. Uh, first of all, Michigan won, Michigan State won, Eastern Michigan won. Woo! Okay. That's over. So the snow's going to start. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and we need to keep in our thoughts and prayers Bob Winkle. He has had a port put in, and he has started his chemotherapy for the uh, lung cancer. So keep that. Is, does anybody know of anybody else that might be in the hospital or need any prayers? Or? Okay. Um, Friday, September 17th, from 1 to 4, um, Sarah and I, who just can't seem to keep out of trouble, are planning um, to, we've invited children, it's a half day at school, I'll get started all over again. It's a professional development at school for the teachers, so that means they're gonna be, it's a early release day. So, kindergarten through fifth graders are going to be off, and we're going to see, we've invited them to come here, similar to what we did over the summer, and we'll have a snack for them um, they may only be here for an hour. They might be here for two hours. We don't know, and we don't know how many are coming. Um, but we will have activities for them. And if we'll need volunteers, uh, sometimes you may feel like you're not doing much, but it's just having an extra set of hands, feet, and eyes because they move quickly, faster than we do. So um, if you can spare a little bit of time on the 17th, that would be wonderful. And then we're going to do tricks and treats on Saturday, October 30th from 4 to 6. So uh, I'll give you a couple weeks, and then I'll start harping on you about signing up, bringing candy, doing games. I can't leave you alone for too long. You'll get in trouble. So you know. And Emily is back in the state, Emily Fricasa. Yay, she's closer to mom and dad, so we're glad to have Emily back. Okay, I'm done. So, now let us start with our call to worship. And blessed are those whose transgression is forgiven. And, and whose sin, sin is, is covered. covered. They are happy, for the Lord declares them not guilty. And, and there, there is, is no, no deception, deception in their, their hearts. Let us worship and rejoice in the one who is our hiding place and and our refuge in times of of trouble. trouble. And for the next two opening songs, please join in with us. Both of them will be sung twice. Rejoice, 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 rejoice
Okay. And um, indulge me for just a moment. I forgot to ask for prayers for my husband, Dan. He's going to be having surgery on Wednesday morning. We have to be at the hospital at 5.30 in the morning. Uh. And the surgery starts at 7.30, and it's probably going to take three hours. So it's supposed to be a complicated one. So I appreciate prayers. Our opening prayer for today, we will read together. Almighty, Almighty God, God, to you, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and perfectly magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we're going to join in another praise song, The Heart of Worship. you would please join together with me in our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from 1 Peter. 
in chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. God's stewards of God's grace. And in this, in this scripture, Peter is reminding the suffering Christians that they are God's chosen people who, like Abraham, are exiled. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same intention, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has finished with sin, so as to live for the rest of your earthly life no longer by human desires, but by the will of God. You have already spent enough time in doing what the Gentiles like to do, living in lasciviousness, passion, drunkenness, revels, carousing, and lawless idolatry. They are surprised that you no longer join them in the same excesses of dissipation, and so they blasphemy. But they will have to give an accounting to him who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was proclaimed, even to the dead, so that though they had been judged in the flesh, as everyone is judged, they might live in the spirit as God does. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and discipline yourselves for the sake of your prayers. And above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is how the earth praises God, giving thanks for God's abundance. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks and the valleys deck themselves with shimmering fields of grain sharing their bounty with the rest of creation. We too are to worship God by being abundant and fruitful with our lives, offering up our yields as if they were songs of joyful praise. Let us worship God now with our time, our talents, and our tithes as the ushers come forward to collect the offering.
you would please join me in our doxology. God, most merciful and gracious, of whose bounty we have all received, we ask that you would accept this offering of your people. We pray that you remember in your love those who have brought it and those for whom it is given, and we ask that you would follow it with your blessing, that it may promote peace and goodwill among all peoples, and help to advance the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated, and I invite you to join me again in an attitude of prayer. As we've done, uh, I believe, the last week or so, there will be a response, and it should be in your uh, bulletin printed there. When I say, gracious God, you will say, hear our prayer. So let's practice that once. Gracious God. Perfect. As we offer our prayers for the world and for ourselves, we will share in times of silence, allowing us to reflect on the needs of others and on our own experiences. As we reflect, it may be that God will speak into that silence and help us to understand the world and our lives in new ways. We remember creation, breathe into life by God's Holy Spirit, places of beauty and brilliance, places of grandeur and spectacle, places of extravagant diversity, we pray, creating God, for places damaged and degraded for people, scraping a living from land made fruitless by human greed. Help us to live sparingly and to care for creation. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We remember humanity breathed into life by God's Holy Spirit, people of beauty and brilliance, people of gifts and grace, people of extravagant diversity. We pray healing God for people whose lives are diminished because they live with their own or another's mental illness, for people facing the stigma caused by misunderstanding about mental illness, for people struggling to find help when they need it. Help us to be welcoming, helpful, and more aware of those things that make for mental well-being for others and ourselves. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We remember the church breathed into life by God's Holy Spirit, a community of beauty and brilliance, a community of love and compassion, a community of extravagant diversity. We pray, inspiring God, for denominations working out how to be one family, offering an effective witness to your love in the world, for churches with projects that offer help to people struggling with mental illness, for ourselves and people in our own families and community who need to be understood, accepted, and loved. Help us to be willing to change ourselves and inspired to change the world. Gracious God, in the name of Christ, amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another, if you would join me in our prayer of confession. Holy One, we long to be faithful stewards of your abundant grace, to serve each other in love and humility, to serve your world with wisdom and energy. 
when our words and actions are not guided by love. Turn our hearts when we act in folly. Restore our energy when it is gone. Sometimes, many times, O oh God, our efforts fail. But your abundant grace is strong and eternal. And forgiveness is ours through Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please take a few moments now for silent prayer and confession. Beloved children of God, the saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with God, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the expiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Again, thanks be to God. Amen. The grace of God has dawned upon us with healing for all the world, so we rejoice to declare our faith in him. And let us join in reading. We believe, believe in God, God the Father, Father who, who has, has revealed, revealed his, his love and, and kindness, kindness to us, and in his mercy saved us, not for any good deed of our own, but because he is merciful. We believe, we believe in, in Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ who gave himself up for us to free us from sin and set us apart for himself, a, a people eager to do good. We, we believe, believe in, in the Holy Spirit, Spirit whom, whom God poured out on us generously through Christ our Savior, so that justified by grace, we might become heirs with the hope of eternal life. Amen. Our next scripture reading comes from the Psalm 32. I feel like I'm going back into the Bible study. <laughs> um, it's the joy of forgiveness of David Amaskil. And Amaskil is considered like a literary or musical term. And Psalms, as we've learned, are, are musical. And they're usually, uh, Sila, oh, oh, I found out another thing. Sila is found, is usually found at the end of the verses in Psalms, and it means forever, and it's a musical direction also. It usually means to, like a break in the music. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no inequity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer, Selah. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin, Selah. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you at a time of distress. The rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with the glad cries of deliverance, Selah. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with a bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. 
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And now we'll be singing, O Lord, may church and home combine. Our third scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. This section is headed, Teach Sound Doctrine. But as for you, teach what is consistent with sound doctrine. Tell the older men to be temperate, serious, prudent, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, tell the older women to be reverent in behavior, not to be slanderers or slaves to drink. They are to teach what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be self-controlled, chaste, good managers of the household, kind, being submissive to their husbands, so that the word of God may not be discredited. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects a model of good works, and in your teachings show integrity, gravity, and sound speech that cannot be censured. Then any opponent will be put to shame, having nothing evil to say of us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you would join me again in an attitude of prayer. O oh God, you commanded us through your disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ, to teach sound doctrine and to teach with integrity. You command that we show ourselves in all respects of our lives to be models of good works. You ask, or we ask you now to clear our minds from distractions and bring your peace to our hearts that we may now receive your teaching. And now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning we are beginning a new sermon series called Back to School, where we're going to be focusing on teaching and what we find about it and witness to it in the Bible. Over the next four weeks, we will look at some of the different teachers in Scripture and some of the critical messages and commandments about teaching that we find there. Well, the NFL season begins this Thursday as the reigning champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers face off against the Dallas Cowboys. But since the Lions don't play until next Sunday afternoon, I suppose I don't have to rush through the sermon this morning, right? Just kidding. Besides, I know that there may be some fans of other teams here today, and many games start at 1 o'clock, so I promise I won't take too long. And as much as it makes me feel like a bit of a hypocrite, having enjoyed six NBA championships in eight years during the Jordan dynasty, 
I have to say I might be pulling a little bit for the Cowboys as I'm getting kind of tired of Tom Brady playing and winning in the Super Bowl. But for the past several weeks, all of these teams have spent hours upon hours practicing for this new season. Players have battled for their positions and some just to make the team. Practice is an essential aspect of the game. It is through practice and repetition that players hope to get better and excel at what they do. And for some players, that hard work and practice pays off with a contract and a roster spot on the team. For others, though, it may not always work out that way. There are only 53 roster spots per team, plus 16 practice players, and there are only 32 NFL teams. That means there are only 1,696 full-time playing spots, or just over 2,200 counting practice players in the whole league. That is anywhere from over 500 to 900 fewer people than the entire population of the town of Clinton, at least according to the 2019 statistics. So it's actually in the ballpark of the total attendance for our annual conference meetings for the Michigan area of the United Methodist Conference. Although we don't usually wear pads and helmets, some years we probably should have. But for the players who do make the teams, they can call themselves NFL players and feel proud of that distinction. But the importance of practice is valid for more than just athletes and in sports. Any of you musicians out here, or out there, you know what kind of time and dedication one must commit to getting better and reach a level of confidence in performing. My sisters both played instruments from junior high through college. One played French horn, the other one played bassoon and their hard work and dedication kept them in first or second chair for their entire playing careers. And I can remember, that, remember them spending countless hours almost every day practicing and practicing. They both ended up receiving scholarships for college for their playing, so I guess all that practice paid off in the end. And to this day, they can both still play and can still call themselves concert musicians. They even got to travel to many places during their college playing career in front of large crowds in places all over this country. Even in our hobbies, practice is essential. I know that practice is crucial for myself and one of the former hobbies I have loved of lapidary art. It can take years of practice to really become good at cutting and polishing stones, knowing where to cut how specific stones react to grinders, discerning the angles of which to work to get the best result. I started doing lapidary work about 20 years ago. Granted, I took some breaks during that time, but when I was working on it, I would practice on pieces of stone that I didn't have any specific plans for before undertaking a new challenge. Practice is essential, and because I did, I felt confidence in calling myself a lapidary artist. And I'm currently trying to do the same thing with a newer hobby of photography. I am taking time to practice and learn to get better as I go, hopefully. Having a camera in my cell phone does make it a little bit easier to practice some aspects of photography almost anywhere. Still given the choice, I prefer the dedicated cameras that allow me more control of the picture taking process. Now as we look at our third and primary scripture reading for this morning from the book of Titus, we, we hear from one of the apostles of Jesus a fundamental commandment about teaching. What does teaching have to do with practice? Well, bear with me here and I, I promise I'll try to connect the dots. In that reading, the very first verse says, teach what is consistent with sound doctrine. Now, we might be asking ourselves in our world today, which doctrine? The Methodist doctrine? What about the Catholics or the Lutherans or the Baptists? Which doctrine is sound? Which doctrine is correct? 
Well, in this situation, the apostle was focusing on the doctrine of their time that Jesus had taught to the disciples and that had been spread by them and the apostles. So the important thing here is that the apostle is telling the people what they had been taught to them by Jesus. Now, if we go further into the scripture reading, there are many things outlined about how different people should live and what they should do. And in that time, those were appropriate for them to follow and be faithful to. Would those same things work for us in our world today? Probably not all of them. And definitely they could be seen as oppressive or unfair, depending on how you look at them and what your gender identity is. But the specific things outlined here are not what I think we need to get caught up in this morning. Let's look at the final two verses of the reading. It says, show yourself in all respects a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, gravity, and sound speech that cannot be censured, then any opponent will be put to shame having nothing evil to say of us. Here the apostle is making an important statement that we need to address. Show yourself in all respects a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity. Yes, the passage goes on after that, but focus on just this part with me for a moment. The apostle is not only telling the people to do good works and to be moral and faithful people, but also to show integrity in their teaching. Or, in other words, practice what you teach. You cannot teach with integrity if you yourself do not follow your own teachings, can you? The do-as-I-say-not-as-I-do model is not an effective way of Christian teaching. The people need to practice the same things they are teaching others. And what were they teaching? They were teaching others about God and Jesus and how to live Christian lives. Doesn't this still apply to us today then too? We cannot call ourselves Christians if we do not live our lives according to to the teachings of Jesus, can we? And we can't try to teach others, whether our children or friends or whoever it may be, about being Christian if we ourselves do not live into that reality either. We must practice what we teach. And if we do not practice living as Christians, we cannot really call ourselves Christians either, can we? If I don't practice and actually do photography, I can't honestly call myself a photographer. Notice I didn't say a professional photographer, just a photographer. If my sisters didn't practice and play their instruments, they could not call themselves musicians. If athletes do not practice and play the game, they cannot call themselves athletes. I mean, if this were not true, then couldn't I stand up here today and say, you know what, I'm a heart surgeon. I've never taken any medical training, never been to medical school, never performed an operation on a living being, or a dead one for that matter, except for that frog in science class. So I can't just call myself a heart surgeon, right? There's no integrity or honesty there. I might want to be a heart surgeon really, really bad, don't. But truthfully, I don't. I am, I'm not really good with, with guts and blood and all that stuff inside you. I'd rather it stay in there. But even if I did, just because I want to do something doesn't mean I can say that I do it if I've never done it and I've never practiced it. We have to remember to practice what we teach. Jesus commands us to love our God and love our neighbor, and he did both of those things. He showed that through his sacrifice of his life for all of creation. He loved God and gave himself to save the creation that God loved. He loved his neighbor, all of humanity, and gave his life to save us from sin and death. 
Jesus truly practiced what he teach, what he taught and preached. He also went out of his way to go out and teach his disciples and the people about being a good neighbor. Like you've heard in the story of the Good Samaritan. And if you're not familiar with that one, it'll be coming up before the end of the year, I think. If not, soon after. But the story of the Good Samaritan teaches us to go out, help those in need, care for each other, love each other. And that is what Jesus did. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, he made the blind see and the lame walk, and countless other miracles and signs of love. Jesus truly practiced what he taught and preached. And that too is what we must do. We need to be practicing what we are teaching. It is what I must do. I can't stand up here week by week and tell you about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the messages that we find in Scripture if I then leave here and do the exact opposite of what I have shared with you and called you to do. I, too, must live by the teachings of Jesus Christ. I, too, must love the Lord my God with all my heart and all my soul. I, too, must love my neighbor as myself. Because if we don't ourselves practice the things that we teach others about God and his love for the world, then we teach with no integrity. We teach one message but live by another. And when people see that, it sends a message, and it's not a good one. When you teach someone something, you are in reality teaching them two lessons. The first is whatever you are trying to actually teach them, whether about God or a mathematical function or how to play an instrument. That is the explicit message or lesson. But the second thing that you are teaching them, which is implicitly, it relates to your following of what you just taught. Because if you teach someone something and then go and do the exact opposite, you are teaching them that what you just taught them doesn't really matter. It's not really important. Because otherwise, you'd be doing it too. How can we go out and share the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ and God's love for the world if we are not also embodying that same love and living out our faith in an authentic way? As Christians, we are called to be Jesus to the world. Part of how that happens is through what we teach the world about Christ and Christians, both explicitly and implicitly. If we tell people that Jesus ate with the outcasts of society of his day, but then we won't even share our blessings with others, what are we actually saying? Look at our food pantry that we have over at the schools. We collect and shop for food to help feed those in need. And then we go and give it to them. Or in some cases, they come and get what they need, but you get the idea. We don't hoard that away in a room somewhere in our church with a locked door, keeping it for ourselves. No. The way our food pantry works is we are practicing what we teach, again, both explicitly and implicitly. Explicitly, we are teaching people to give to help others when we ask for their donations to our food pantries. And many of you have donated just a ton of But implicitly, we are also teaching the people who donate food as well as the people who receive the food that this is a good thing to be involved in and doing because then we are going and actually giving that food to the people who need it. We are practicing what we teach. I want you today, and as we advance through this series, Try and think about all of the titles or identities that you have. Mother, 
father, grandparents, child, teacher, carpenter, musician, athlete, whatever it might be. And then I want you to think about the two most important ones, if not the most important ones, really. First and foremost, you are a Christian. But second, and really more importantly than that, you are a child of God. I pray that when we leave this place and always that we practice both of those things with integrity and faithfulness and we practice what we teach to others. Amen. It is now time for us to celebrate Holy Communion and I'm hoping I remember to put all that information in the bulletin. I did. Sweet. All right. The Lord be with you. Lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. And so Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ, and the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. In the United Methodist Church, we practice open communion, and what that means is that during this time, if we were in the sanctuary, I'd have a table in front of me, and that table doesn't belong to me to this church, to our denomination. It belongs to Jesus Christ and he alone. And he has invited everyone to come and partake. It doesn't matter your race, your gender, your mental or physical ability, whether you're rich or poor, young or old, baptized or unbaptized, all those ways we try and, and divide ourselves and separate ourselves, those boxes we try and cram ourselves into, he doesn't see any of that. He sees us all as beloved children of God. All he asks for you to partake in this time is to come with an open heart. Now, obviously, we are still not back to doing communion in the normal way. We are using our individual elements. And we can do this one of two ways. You can do intinction, which is a big word that means you take your bread, you dip it in your juice, and you receive your elements together. Or you can eat your bread and then drink your juice. Those are both completely acceptable. Neither one gets you a higher grade in the grade book. And there really isn't a grade book, so don't even worry about it. But either way, whatever works for you, whatever you are feeling in this moment, they're both acceptable. Brothers and sisters, beloved children of God, the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you, I invite you to now receive your elements. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you would rise as you are able for our closing hymn, number 355, Depth of Mercy. Beloved children of God, go now into the world inspired by the extravagant love of God. Live generously with open hands, loving one another as if your lives depended on it. Be good stewards of the gifts you have received so that God may be glorified in all that you say and do. And may the abundant love of God surround you. May the extravagant grace of Jesus Christ sustain you. 
And may the constant presence of the Holy Spirit inspire and encourage you in every good deed and word. Amen. Have a blessed week.